Good evening. I'm Robin Kokomo Rangel, a Walnut Creek Library Foundation board member, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's virtual live from the library program, where author, photographer, and designer Josie Iselin will talk about her latest book, The Curious World of Seaweed. I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, The Simpson Family, Masterpiece sponsors, Kristen and Ray Abraham, and myself and Arthur Engel. Classic sponsors, Cindy and Bob Britton, Lynn and Gregory Nerland, and Lisa Wren and Peter Mangini. Best-selling sponsors, Cindy and Gary Darling, and Denise and Michael Weiner. As well as our media and print sponsors, Diablo Magazine, East Bay Times, and Minuteman Press Lafayette. First, can I tell you how much I loved this book? Josie's beautiful portraits of seaweed and kelp blend together the art and science of marine algae and honor the contributions that marine algae make to the oceanic, excuse me, oceanic sea ecosystem. Her writing also highlights a number of of women scientists who were crucial in broadening our understandings of the oceans. Through art, design, and research, Josie celebrates the marine flora and brings thoughtfulness and stewardship to the realm of our oceans. Josie is an ideal scientific interpreter as she melds knowledge and art with experience and empathy. Now, I know you've been admiring my scarf. <laughs> so let me tell you that in addition to writing several books and creating fine art prints, Josie also designed silk scarves using the same imagery of sea glass, stones, and plants found along the ocean's edge. More information about all of Josie's work can be found at www.josieiselin.com. And I think we'll try to get that into the chat. Josie holds a BA in Visual and Environmental Studies from Harvard University and an MFA from San Francisco State University. The Curious World of Seaweed has been shortlisted for both the Northern California Book Awards and the Alice Award honoring illustrated books. Copies of her book can be purchased at Flashlight Books in Walnut Creek and will include an autographed book plate. Now, if you enjoyed tonight's program, please consider making a donation to the Library Foundation. Visit our website at www.wclibrary.org and click on the green donate button at the top of the screen. Gary and Jean McCorney, two longtime supporters of Walnut Creek Libraries and the Walnut Creek Library Foundation, have agreed to match the donations we received tonight up to $500. So your donations will be doubled. The link to donate is also provided in the chat box for your convenience. Now, before we meet Josie, she'd like to introduce us to her work with a short video. So sit back and prepare for a visual feast as you enter the curious world of seaweed. Seaweeds and kelp are some of the great eco-engineers of our planet. They are photosynthesizing powerhouses, growing rapidly in cold waters, creating the base of the vast ocean food chain. Kelp and seaweeds provide crucial habitat for countless other organisms both tiny and large. They sink carbon and oxygenate their nearshore waters. Marine algae, another name for seaweed, are essential and also spectacularly beautiful. Their stories are compelling and important and deserve to be told with more than words. My newest book, The Curious World of Seaweed, begins like this. The thin region where the sea meets the land is unlike either land or sea. It is betwixt and between, a threshold from one state to another. It is a linear point or a coastal ribbon, a place of dramatic change and remarkable abundance. 
abundance of life, and also of possibility. From the ocean's perspective, the approach to the world's great land masses is from the deep and dark pelagic, up over a continental shelf into a dim region where light barely penetrates the water, and on up into a brighter photic zone, what might be called the subtidal, and continues into the low intertidal where the extreme full moon tides pull away the water once or twice a month, and up towards the beach or rocky reef where the ocean swells in and out in six-hour cycles, and up finally to the highest tide mark, the rack line, where the ocean leaves its debris to mark a final encroachment towards dry land. This sliver of ocean, where sunlight penetrates enough to allow photosynthesis to work its magic, and where the benthos, or ocean bottom, provides something to hold on to, is the home of the seaweeds, or marine algae. The Pacific Ocean's edge, where it encounters the North American continent, is considered one of the richest of these rich zones. This slice of ocean, from Alaska to Baja, California in Mexico, has some of the most diverse and abundant seaweeds and kelps on Earth. The rocky, fog-shrouded coast sports a spectacular number of seaweed species, from enormous kelps to tiny corallines. The portraits and artwork made using my flatbed scanner have taken me deep into the world of seaweed, initiating a journey into scientific storytelling, ocean advocacy, and algal empathy. I hope you might come with me. Thank you, Robin, so much uh, for that introduction. And I'm absolutely delighted um, to be here. Uh, the um, uh, Walnut Creek Library Association um, is um, wonderful. I'm, I feel um, honored to be invited. Libraries are essential to everything that I do. And I, might, I, I really think that the book is my muse in a way. Um, so what I want to do is take you on my journey um, into the world of seaweed. That video uh, was kind of my exploration of a different way of bringing uh, the world of the book out uh, to a broader audience and was made right when um, the COVID shutdown happened and all of my book events uh, last spring were canceled. So I got to explore how to bring the material together in a video. So um, you are one of the, the first to get to experience that in one of these talks. Um, I'm gonna get right in here and share my screen and um, we will go on a journey um, that really is um, about my mission of bringing the seaweeds and kelps, which are really quite unfamiliar uh, to us landlubbers um, or us terrestrial inhabitants, um, to, to, my, my mission is to bring them to us. Um, they're most often hidden by what I call um, the lid of the tide. We can't hike out into the kelp forest like we can uh, into uh, the redwood forest. So um, I'm constantly strategizing on different ways of bringing these fantastic organisms uh, to us. So here we go. Um, this was an, uh, an installation for a gallery in Alameda um, uh, where I hung these 94 inch curtains uh, that, I've, that I've made with uh, some of this imagery of the seaweeds. You have the wonderful rosy erythrophyllum on the left. You have agresia or feather boa kelp, then the palmaria or dulse, and on the right, the macrocystis or giant kelp. Um, I also use these curtains to enliven uh, a, a completely unused uh, video store. Um, a bunch of us artists were asked by the Arts Commission at, uh, of Alameda to enliven an underused shopping center. Uh, so I was given the video store and again, um, hung these oversized uh, kelp and seaweeds in a position where a whole festival was taking place outside and um, there was music and food trucks and dancing and children's performances and amidst that, that, um, uh, there was this encounter with the seaweeds. Um, so these are really at scale. Again, those, those um, 
um, curtains are quite large. And I just want to take you into my studio here. Um, so what you're seeing here is what's right to the right of me here in my studio. And it's my scanner. It's where all of this uh, portraiture, as I call it, portraiture of the seaweeds is made. And I've been using my scanner for many, many years. And it actually started with a little book called Beach Stones. And you can see my uh, little collection of helper stones there in front of the scanner. Now, if I were scanning those stones, something opaque, I would leave the scanner as it is now. I would carefully place them on the glass and the scan would reflect, the light would reflect off the object uh, and um, where it doesn't have anything to reflect off of, it would default uh, to black. I would leave that top open there. But for the seaweeds, uh, like you see I have on there, a beautiful little prionitis, I would take that white cover off of that top element there and I take that off and what, I, what is underneath that is a second light element. And so I close um, the top there and I might, if I have a wet seaweed on there or something that's a little bit three-dimensional and I don't want to squish it, I'll use my helper stones to hold the top a little bit. Um, but that second light element is going to push light through the specimen as the scan is being captured. And that gives me this incredibly luminous uh, image that comes right up into Photoshop uh, on, my, um, on my monitor right here. And the background defaults to white. And that is how I'm able to get uh, this incredible resolution. I can scan very small things or even large things like this kelp at high resolution. So I have the option to design with them, not only for the books, but also for large scale fine art prints and also other installations uh, like this, where we have these curtains um, that are again hung at kind of an architectural scale. This is uh, back to Alameda where that festival was going on. And as, as folks were walking by, they got to encounter the Neriocystis or bull kelp and the more rosy uh, pink purple um, palmaria. Uh, something that many, most people really haven't encountered because you have to get out into the intertidal or you have to get um, under the ocean as a snorkeler or a diver. And, and that's really not available to most of us. So I love it when I get to um, collaborate with the scientific community, uh, which I've gotten to know so well over the years of, of researching and writing these various books. And this was a conference of the Northeast Algal Society in New Haven at, at the gallery. This is an installation at the gallery uh, at the University of New Haven, where I again hung um, these curtains and it was a funny kind of, um, architectural space, but I really could enliven the space uh, with these curtains hung a little bit away from the wall. So the lighted wall actually um, comes through uh, the curtains. Um, and here you have on the far right, the um, lovely sausage like cytosiphon uh, and then the sea grapes uh, just beyond it. And I gave a presentation in the gallery space. It was the um, welcome event of the conference. And I, I that conference, its, its mantra was broaden your impact. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the scientists, uh, seaweed scientists who study seaweed are called phycologists. This phycology community is always anxious to bring their research out to a broader audience. And I feel like that's uh, my role to play as the artist who's come to understand their world, their scientific world. And that's been really by and large, a really wonderful collaboration. So this is what the scanner allows me to achieve. What you have on the left is that beautiful erythrofilum. Uh, this is kind of its native environment is the monitor that I'm showing you this on here. Um, you can see that I scanned this erythrofilum on the left when it was still wet. It has a little bit of the ocean still with it. Um, you can see the, the lines, the contours of the wet spots. And that really is the color that this seaweed is. One of the beautiful things about this scanner is it's very true to color. And you know how as a, as a photographer out in the world, that's really um, a remarkable thing. Uh, with a camera, you're always, um, at the whims of what kind of light source you're at, but not so with the camera. It's very, uh, with the scanner, it's very consistent and very true uh, to the specimen in hand. So my first book of seaweed, the an ocean garden, which which we'll get to eventually, was really these, these straight ahead portraits. And then I started um, making these uh, more abstracted collage 
like um, imagery. Uh, and this is um, a wonderful agglomeration of the wonderful sea sacs or halosacion. And these were found uh, one day um, at, at Fort Funston. So I walk very, very regularly at Fort Funston, the beach uh, that's just here in San Francisco. And there happened to be a whole um, slew of these sea sacs strewn up on the beach. And I uh, collected them, got them home into my studio. And you can see that each of these sea sacs has a little bit of the ocean uh, within it. They actually, their strategy for keeping hydrated during the low tide is to actually hydrate from within. So I want us to think about what these seaweeds have to do in the intertidal zone, that part of the rocky reef where the tide goes in and out. And it's really an existence that we humans have a hard time kind of wrapping our mind around. I mean, we take for granted that say our atmosphere is always there. Well, imagine if it got sucked out and came back in every six hours. Well, that's what the seaweeds have to, have to deal with. And these sea sacs um, have this kind of different strategy than the folios uh, seaweeds. Um, this is uh, two historical uh, pressings that I scanned and then overlaid with uh, some of the color from some other seaweeds. Uh, these feathery seaweeds are called Gloeosiphonia, and the historical pressing was from the 1880s and was made in uh, Monterey. So as a designer and an artist, the seaweeds have presented me with so much delight, so much visual delight. Uh, and, and here, this is just exemplified by the Maziella volans on the right, this spoon-shaped seaweed that really is this kind of wonderful mid-century uh, form and this wonderful uh, purplish color. And then I get to pair that on the page uh, with these egregia pods, these whimsical egregia pods uh, that I just, they were so similar yet different. And the scanner lets me uh, capture that olive color and pair it with um, the purple. And this is where my books begin is with this visual delight. And the Egregia menziesii or feather boa kelp, one of the iconic foundational kelps uh, of our California coast is really where I began in terms of thinking about telling these seaweed stories that make up the curious world of seaweed. And I wanted to see if I could write an essay about this particular curiosity. There's nothing in our world that really um, translates uh, that, that helps us understand the feather boa. It, it doesn't have a tree shape or a flower form. Um, it is its own, its own oddity. And it's very different um, from um, specimen to specimen, even though it's all one species. Um, so that was the first essay that I wrote um, in The Curious World of Seaweed. And it was called Empathy for a Kelp, the very first, um, it was part of kind of my proposal for the book to see if we could take ourselves into its world. And then as an artist, I kind of went even further and I took quite a lot of inspiration here from a wonderful artist uh, named Rex Ray. And he's a San Francisco artist that very sadly died way too young in 2015. And he walked the line between um, being a graphic designer and doing commercial art and being a fine artist. And he made these wonderful, wonderful um, collaged, um, um, magnificent compositions using cut out uh, organic shapes of paper, of these pattern paper that he would make. And he was kind of um, subversive even in the beauty that he created. And I thought, well, maybe I could use the, the blade elements of the egregia in this case, or of the seaweeds to also kind of collage or work with abstraction. So that kind of inspiration coming from other artists is very important to me. Um, and here I took inspiration from the great Anna Atkins. And Anna Atkins was a wonderful polymath of the Victorian era. And she made the very first photographically reproduced book. Um, and usually that honor goes to a man, Henry Fox Talbot. And no, it really belongs uh, to Anna Atkins. Uh, she published that book in 1840. And it was um, made using this cyanotype technique. 
Um, and so I started in her honor using my seaweed specimens. Uh, so her book was um, British algae. She was using her uh, specimens of the seaweeds that she had collected, um, cyanotype impressions was how she called them. So I, in her honor, started making cyanotype impressions in my backyard, which is right there um, and is sunny uh, in the daytime, uh, whereby I coat a, uh, um, pieces of paper with a light sensitive emulsion. And then I expose to the sunlight with my specimens, my seaweed specimens on top. And it creates, when you wash it out in water, it creates this wonderful shadow. And as I was making these cyanotypes, I realized that my scanning technique is actually working in this lineage of nature printing that the cyanotype is very much a part of. Now nature printing is whereby the specimen itself is used to make the print. Um, and so the specimen is making its shadow in the cyanotype printing. And then my scanner, because I'm working directly from the specimen, my scanner is actually also kind of working in that lineage. And I thought it would be wonderful to lay my scans into it, the shadow, its own shadow that's created in the cyanotype. Um, and so that dialogue across time is really wonderful um, for me, is very much a part of this exploration. Um, this is, so this piece uh, is uh, Pikea Californica. And so this image is also is in the book, um, in the chapter on color, but it also exists as this large scale fine art print. Um, and this is the wonderful Apuntiella, which often presents as these kind of mouse ears. Um, and again, I had fun playing with this relationship between the specimen, my scan and its shadow. So um, An Ocean Garden was my first book on seaweed and I, I call it a visual primer. Uh, it's where I was learning all about the seaweed as I was making uh, these very straight ahead scans. And I was learning about the seaweeds through uh, the, a series of workshops uh, hosted by Kathy Ann Miller, who's the curator of marine algae at um, uh, UC Berkeley, which has the foremost collection of, um, of, of, of specimens. All of the specimens of the West Coast have been collected over across at, at UC Berkeley's um, uh, herbarium. But as I got to the end of that book, I, I was diving deeper into the history of the science of the seaweeds. And I realized that there was this very strong visual component to the taxonomic history, the history of the naming of the seaweeds. And what you see here are these four historical lithographs that I've overlaid onto this other historical pressing of the great microcladia. And these are four lithographs that were part of a, 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 a publication that came out in 1853 that was the first description of these iconic kelps of our California coast. And you have the Stephanocystis on the left, you have Dictyonurum, Pterogophora, and then on the right, the Egregia. And these were these fold out lithographs in the back of the, the publication by uh, Ruprecht, who was the botanist in Russia, who did the naming, who was, who was doing the taxonomic descriptions, these original descriptions. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun if I, again, had this dialogue across time uh, with my contemporary scans, playing with and working with these historical lithographs. And so here, this is the Egregia menziesii, um, and this, this historical lithograph is this fold out plates that is actually six feet tall. It's just one of these spectacular um, historical elements. Um, this is uh, a scan of Costaria costata or five ribbed kelp on its cousin, the Dictyonurum. Um, and so each of these images for me is really about creating this vector from past to present but a vector actually extends, it has an arrow on it. And so underlying all of my work is the question uh, about where are these seaweeds heading? This vector extends from past to present into the future. And, and the underlying question to all of my research and writing and image making is where are these organisms going to be in an uncertain future uh, with our changing oceans? Um, this here is, Nori, 
uh, or pyropia, and I've overlaid it onto a lithograph by Alexander Postels done as part of the great um, folio called Illustraciones Algarum that was published in 1840. Uh, there were these huge oversized lithographs uh, made from specimens collected uh, in uh, an exploratory ex expedition to Alaska. Um, and so most of the seaweeds uh, from um, Alaska, which is incredibly rich in its seaweed flora, extend most of the, the, the biogeography or uh, the range of those seaweeds extend down into California. Um, and so these are some of my collections of the nori. And you can see the range in color here. It really does get often to be this deep, deep purple. I call those my nori dancers. Um, and then on the left, you have um, some fresh nori uh, that is that dusky green um, olive color. And you can see along the edges uh, that some of the reproductive uh, elements are viewable there on the edges of that nori that's still wet uh, from the ocean. This is Olva. And Olva is um, what I call the signature uh, species of the green group of seaweeds. And it is fundamentally green. It has only chlorophyll in it. And it, this again is overlaid on one of these lithographs by um, Alexander Postels. And this is Stephanocystis. This is one of the really common kelps that you'll find on the beaches. Uh, right now, it's one of the few kelps that I'm finding out on the beach and I'll find scraps of just the top part, this wonderful graphic uh, beaded rack is what it's called. Um, and it really is like those pot beads. Um, wonderfully golden. Uh, and um, in the chapter on this, I write about why these, um, why you find just the top parts of this particular kelp on our beaches and not the whole, typically not the whole um, organism. And I've overlaid it here on uh, the fantastic lithograph that, that was uh, created for the Ruprecht portfolio uh, folio from uh, 1853. And this is the image that was chosen uh, by Heyday Books, the designer and art director at Heyday Books for the cover of the book. So as I build these books, I am working out the visual, a lot of that um, old on new imagery was what drove my research. Uh, and I'm building each of these chapters with visual elements uh, combining them with uh, my text as I'm developing the, the actual essays uh, for each chapter. And then I hand an entire InDesign file uh, with all the images and the text in there uh, to the designers at, um, in this case, Heyday Books. And I had a wonderful, wonderful collaborative time uh, with their designers there. And they, I do kind of a rough layout and then they really take it the next level, create this gorgeous, gorgeous cover uh, and all the refinements and details that make the book a beautiful, beautiful object in the hand. Um, I might note that it is also an audible, um, uh, um, uh, offering. So I'll mention that again at the end. But this is the table of contents. So the Curious World of Seaweed is 16 chapters and each one is uh, about an iconic seaweed or kelp from our California or entire Pacific coast. But I want to make the point that this is just 16 of many. Um, we are, are blessed to live in one of the richest of the rich zones, as I mentioned in my video, uh, for um, the flora, for uh, the seaweeds and kelps. Um, and so this um, 16 is only a tiny, tiny tip of the incredible biodiversity uh, that um, uh, the marine algae offer uh, and, and create um, in terms of the ecology. Um, and and so I'm showing you this slide to say for a couple of reasons, and that is that we can't see the biodiversity I've just mentioned. This is why the world of the seaweeds, which are out there, they're under there, they're under this incredibly rough coast. This is, the, this is um, taken off of McCarricker State Park up um, in, uh, off of uh, near Fort Bragg. So this is the Mendocino Coast. Uh, this is um, a spring. This is what our coast has been looking like this spring where the Northwest winds have been pounding us for days. Um, so number one, we can't see it. 
But number two, this slide is significant because it's showing you that northwest wind that comes up in the springtime and is absolutely foundational to the growth of the seaweeds. It's this constant northwesterly breeze, breezes that push away the surface waters in the springtime and allow those deep, cold, nutrient-rich ocean waters to come up to the surface and gives rise to the great phenomenon of upwelling. And you've probably all heard about it, but to actually know the mechanics of how it works uh, is, is really good to know. And so if you've all been experiencing what I certainly have been experiencing, I have my sweater on here, it's been freezing all spring. It's been blowing like mad. And that's these great Northwesterlies that have been blowing without cease. Now, while I find it frustrating because I want a little warmth, for the seaweeds, this is fabulous. It means that the cold upwelling can happen. Um, all those nutrients, the uh, magnesium and phosphorus and nitrogen and all of those elements that make up the nutrient base for the primary production of our oceans that combine with the longer days of sunshine, uh, that, that the, the driver uh, of photosynthesis um, all of those, the, the nutrient rich ocean and uh, the sunlight driving photosynthesis combine um, to make the great richness of our primary production, which is the seaweeds, the biomass, the thing that everything else eats, the bottom of the food chain, uh, the, the eco engineer. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is another version of that great biodiversity of our seaweeds. Um, and it's this textured uh, rack or detritus that you find on the beach. And so um, I'm sure that none of you are squeamish about seeing the seaweed on the beach, um, but I hope that the next time you go to the beach, you actually take one step closer uh, into the, the detritus and really look at it and notice um, number one, all the textures and colors like you see here, but also I want to point out what you'll find is all sorts of, of critters eating the seaweed and breaking it down. Uh, so the kelp flies and the isopods and all the other insects, those are tremendously important for the ecology of the beach there. And think about the bird populations and how much they depend on all of those, all of that kind of protein base that is surrounding, is breaking down the seaweeds, uh, and, and, and especially for migrating birds. It's a bonanza. Um, so, and also uh, these, this, the uh, nutrients of this detritus uh, works its way up into the nearshore ecology. So these are very important. But back to the colors. It's just wonderful. You can see all sorts of texture here. Um, and so now I'm gonna get into a little bit of the science of the seaweeds. Um, so the basic color groups of the seaweeds are the reds, the greens, and the browns. And the greens, as I've said, are just pure chlorophyll, chlorophyll A and B. These uh, green seaweeds are the ones that migrated up uh, into the near shore ecology and gave rise to our terrestrial plants. So the, the chlorophyll of our leaves and grasses and, um, and our terrestrial vascular plants is all from uh, the green seaweeds. Very, very, very early on, the greens and reds split from their common ancestor, the cyanobacteria, um, and the reds developed uh, two accessory pigments to help them collect different wavelengths of light. Uh, they developed, a, there's a red and a blue accessory pigment in the red seaweeds, and they combine to make these inc this incredible array of pinks and purples and magentas. The browns are a much later evolutionary lineage, and they have a brown accessory pigment uh, that combine with the chlorophyll to give you the golden browns, olive colors uh, that make up um, the brown seaweeds. So kelps are a subset of the browns. And so anything that has a pneumaticist or a bulb, a bladder is in the kelp category. Uh, so that just clarifies that a little bit. I, I write a lot more about pigmentation uh, in a whole chapter on color in uh, The Curious World. And this is the, the seaweed that I highlight in that book. It's Maziella uh, Splendens. And what you see here is that just perfect combination of the red and the, um, the red and the blue pigmentation making this incredible purple. Um, and so I want you to think a little bit about the fact that we're very used to one spectrum of light, daylight is very high in the red spectrum, very heavy in the red. Well, red is not necessarily uh, the wavelength that penetrates the ocean. Um, different wavelengths penetrate the ocean. So the red seaweeds have 
become very adept at collecting different wavelengths of light by using those different pigments. So now we're gonna move on to kelp. And this is really foundational to my work now, uh, to all sorts of issues uh, that are going on on our North Coast. There's been all sorts of articles being written lately. Uh, and so I wanna take you through uh, the life history of the bull kelp or Neriocystis lutkiana. These are two juvenile kelps that I got back. Uh, they washed up at Fort Funston. I got them onto my scanner. Uh, they're youngins, um, but the, the, the story of the bull kelp is that it is an annual. Um, so, so the seaweeds and kelps do break down into perennials where holdfasts and um, uh, persist and they grow from year to year or annuals where the entire organism uh, um, um, starts afresh each season. And the young babies are starting right now. So these are some historical pressings of very young um, uh, bull kelp. The, the bladder is maybe as big as my thumbnail tiny, uh, but in a matter of months. So we're in April. So maybe by July, you will have the massive bull kelp that can um, grow as much as 60 feet from, from the rocky bottom up to the surface. Uh, and this um, has really become an iconic image for me in terms of this storytelling and the stories of the, of the, um, of the bull kelp. Um, uh, but this was, um, is how you might find it in July. So within six uh, months, you have this tremendous amount of biomass that's accumulated. And this is uh, what a healthy kelp forest um, will look like uh, in the early summer. Uh, this is a photograph taken by Marco Mazza. Uh, and you can see how that bladder is working in service of getting those blades as close to the surface as possible so that it can photosynthesize as efficiently as possible. Now I'm not talking about it, but it, but but along so as much, but what, what goes along with this whole conversation about the kelp forest is the unbelievable diversity in the ecology that, that it creates. As I keep saying, it's an eco-engineer. That means that fish populations and um, invertebrate populations and larval uh, nurseries and um, predators uh, um, go after prey and prey hide from predators. Uh, the kelp forest is a rich, rich, rich uh, ecology that's very important, and they are also um, very efficient carbon sinks. As I mentioned, the, the bull kelp is an annual, so by the midsummer to late summer, it has to reproduce. So this, these are some scans of the reproductive patches, or sori. Uh, the spore patches uh, that you start to see on the blades of the Neriocystis, the bull kelp, come mid to late summer. And you can see, I just think it's one of the most remarkable things how um, the cells right around the sori, the, the spore patch, actually start to loosen. They create a halo. And the, this, this sori or, or patch, which contains millions and millions of spores, actually falls away um, down to the, the ocean bottom uh, and disperses its spores down there. Uh, this was a photograph I took on a snorkeling uh, trip in Mendocino a couple of years ago, and you can see how some of the patches have fallen away and it leaves these um, kind of strips, almost like your cookie dough uh, after you've cut out the cookies. And now I want to I want to just kind of point out some of the issues that are happening with our kelp forest um, uh, on the north coast. So bull kelp is the foundational kelp of our kelp forests uh, from the Golden Gate uh, up north through California, the Pacific Northwest, uh, British Columbia, and Southeast and Alaska through to the Aleutian Islands. This uh, was a picture taken in 2008 in Van Damme State Park, which is just south of Mendocino. And you can see 2008 was a gangbuster year for um, kelp. And the bull kelp actually, um, there's, there's some really cool publications out rare. It's very cyclical in its, um, in its boom years and bust years. And this was a boom year uh, and it was just, uh, you know, birds could just walk across this matting of bull kelp. Um, this was taken in 2017 when I was uh, snorkeling and kayaking in the bull kelp right here. It's the exact same patch of bull kelp. Um, um, but it's much more open. And then this was when I was driving by in 2019, last, just the summer before last, uh, when I was going up to do a talk up in Fort Bragg and I stopped off and this was that same patch. This was August again, when uh, there was no kelp at all. And 
this this is a historic kelp patch that even in the in the down years uh, of the kelp cycles, there's always been some kelp here, uh, at least, um, and now there is none. And what struck me when I was there was how fine it looked. It was a beautiful day. The water was crystal clear. It was this aqua color. The beach was beautiful. There were kayakers going out. Nothing was telling me something was wrong. So that's very interesting to me as a storyteller is how do we remember what we're forgetting? Um, and there's a wonderful historical ecologist named Mia Tegner uh, that I'm starting to reference in my new writing. Uh, and she was really uh, stressing that these ghosts that have uh, fallen out of the system need to be uh, part of the storytelling. So what is happening under there? Well, here you have this healthy um, um, bull kelp on the left. Uh, this was again, that snorkeling trip in 2019. And on the right, just right next to this was a very healthy bull kelp that was attached to the bottom, but had been pinned to a vertical rock face by these purple sea urchins. So between 2014 and 2016, a number of events happened uh, on our California coast that allowed this explosion of uh, the population of purple sea urchins. Now, sea urchins are an herbivore. They're absolutely natural in our kelp forest. They are one of the invertebrates that are part of a healthy ecology, um, and they typically eat kelp detritus. Um, but they are very, very efficient at, um, if they don't have the kelp detritus, at actually eating the kelp itself. And that's what you're seeing here. And what happened um, over the course of 2014 to 2016 was we had a huge warm blob come down and park itself um, off our California coast. Uh, that combined the next year with an El Nino event that gave us a couple of years of overly warm ocean. At the same time, we had the starfish wasting disease and a very effective um, star, uh, urchin predator called Pycnopodia or sunflower sea star uh, wasted away. And it's just been calculated in the last um, few months, in fact, that billions of those sea stars uh, were lost in that starfish wasting disease and they have not recovered. Other intertidal starfish have come back, uh, you'll see. So what that's given rise to is, is these vast urchin barrens. There's been this regime shift from healthy kelp forest to urchin barren, where you just have uh, these uh, deserts, these spiny deserts um, of the purple urchins. Uh, there are purple urchins and red urchins, so you'll often see some red urchin in there. And you see one abalone in here. So abalone are also detritivores. Uh, they also eat kelp, um, but the abalone uh, have really, really suffered um, as well. Um, one of the things about the urchin that is really remarkable is that even if they don't have any kelp left to eat, they don't die. They go into this kind of zombie state uh, that all it needs is a scrap of, of algae to come by to kind of revive them. Um, so it's very, very hard to shift out of the urchin barren state. Now, one of the reasons that um, <laughs> this has happened um, is that Typically, an ecology might have some redundancy in it. Uh, and the redundancy of the top predators in our kelp forest was, was historically both the Pycnopodia, the sunflower star, and the sea otter. Sea otters are voracious eaters of invertebrates. Uh, they have to eat about a quarter of their body weight every day. And uh, healthy sea urchins are a favorite. So in a healthy kelp forest where the urchins are eating enough or have enough kelp detritus uh, to keep them rich inside and protein filled, uh, they are uh, key uh, to the diet of, of sea otters. And in turn, sea otters can keep resilience within the kelp forest. Now, none of the urchin barrens uh, of, our, of our North Coast can actually support uh, a sea otter right now, but we have to remember in terms of thinking about Mia Tegner and the historical ecology that our kelp forests evolved with the sea otter in it. And these are some photographs uh, of the, these are some drawings made by Edna Fisher, who was one of the first zoologists who studied the sea otter when they were first rediscovered on the South, in the central California in 1938. And you can see how integral she has the sea otter with the bull kelp in particular. Uh, it's where the mamas um, put their babies as a nursery while they go dive uh, for those sea urchins. Um, and you can see how camouflaged the, the sea otter are in the bull kelp. So that 
um, integration of the otter with the bull kelp is, is important to remember. Uh, and the fur trade, of course, was what uh, killed off all the otter on the North Coast. Um, by 1880s, 1890s, there were really no otter left. That's why the Russians left um, Fort Ross and the Sonoma and, and North Coast. There's no more fur left for them uh, uh, to extract. Um, so this was my piece that I made as kind of an homage to the bull kelp that is uh, disappearing on uh, in the Sonoma and Mendocino coastline. But let's quickly, um, I'm, I'm sure we're um, running out of time here, but um, let's quickly just go back to some color um, and to show you some of this incredible array of seaweeds that you'll encounter in um, the Curious World of Seaweed. Weeksia is named after the Mrs. Weeks and she comes up uh, throughout the book uh, and you'll read about her. This is the wonderful Postelsia, which is a cousin to the Nereocystis or bull kelp. Um, and is uh, kind of an iconic, uh, almost our state kelp, I think. Um, it's, it's protected on our California coast and it was put on the cover of this, um, this yearbook of the Minnesota Seaside Station. Uh, and I'll let you read about that, but it was founded by a wonderful woman named Josephine Tilden, who is just remarkable. And I'll let you um, explore about her. Um, this is coralline algae. Coralline algae is foundational to our intertidal zones. Um, it gives clues to other algae to, to, to land on it or to invertebrates to settle there. You have the encrusting coralline on the bottle and then you have the articulated coralline and it is a red algae and that's why it is uh, presenting as pink here. And the coralline algae actually calcify in their cell walls as a strategy against being eaten by all those invertebrates. Um, and this is a collection I got to go out to the Great Botanical Beach up in, um, in British Columbia on the west coast of Vancouver Island, which was an algal wonderland. I'm going to zip through these, but they'll give you a taste of what there is in the book. The colander kelp or agarum uh, lets me talk about the great um, George Steller and his expedition and the Bering expedition. And I talk about how his specimens um, from the 1740s are then used a generation later after they've crossed the entire Russian continent. Um, they settle into the Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg and are found a generation later by Gamelin, a precocious young scientist who wrote the very first um, history or, or natural history or description of just the seaweeds and really gave rise to the study of the seaweeds in their own right as their own corner of botany. Um, and so this, these are two of the lithographs from Alexander Postel's made a century later, but they are named after Gamelin uh, there. And this is the great agarum of, or holy kelp. So the surf grass and eelgrass get their own chapter. They're enormously important. Again, these are ecologies right now where there's a lot of emphasis on restoration. Uh, surf grass, um, these, are, these are not algae. They're actually plants that evolved back into the oceans. Uh, the surf grass out into the surf zone, but the eelgrass is what makes up the meadows of the estuaries and uh, bays of um, enormous, enormous amounts of our coastline. And it really behooves us to restore these uh, eelgrass ecologies. They're enormous carbon sinks. They uh, are eco-engineers, so they, uh, they are home to many, many other species. And um, uh, there was just an article about maybe the flowers, because they're flowering plants, can produce rice-like uh, food stuffs for us. So maybe they can become a food, a food source. Um, the surf grass, has this wonderful um, uh, attendant algae uh, epiphyte that grows on it called Spithora. And it is this beautiful little winged uh, pyropia-like um, algae that is this red. And these are some of the eelgrass specimens I got from the, um, the, the um, labs right up at the Estuarian and Ocean Science Center or Romberg Tiburon Center of Kathy Boyer, who is really doing seminal work on um, eelgrass restoration in the Bay. So now I'm just going to finish uh, with some pretty pictures, but some of it is more of my more recent work. Uh, this is one of the images of this layering of the historical and the contemporary and my playing around that went into make one of my scarf designs, is, which is what I'm wearing another one of. 
here. Um, this was a proposal actually for a mural uh, for, the, for a law school um, with a strong environmental law program. And I thought, well, I would like to propose that there are five foundational kelp uh, that are as important to see in that context as maybe some of the founding fathers. Um, but this exploration gave rise to these um, composites which um, went into making the video. And you can see that video, it's, there's a link to it right on the front page of my um, website. And also it's uh, a, a YouTube link um, and the, the uh, resolution is much, much clearer than um, perhaps. So, so I hope you go back and revisit that. But these, I really wanted to give a sense of the richness that's right at the ocean's edge. Um, so that's what this series uh, of images are. Um, all about, and they are very, very high resolution. So the idea is that these can be big murals, they could be projected onto walls, they can translate into architectural scale, um, and they can be big prints, big fine art prints. Um, and this is one where you can see that all of the elements are actually still wet. So all of these are scanned as fresh specimens, whereas uh, the, the two previous were um, scans of dried and pressed specimens. But the color palette here is just something I can't get enough of. Um, and then I just experimented with going in even closer. Um, the shutdown uh, last spring gave me an opportunity to really spend some uh, time um, with my scanner and with these seaweed specimens. Um, I just was scanning this afternoon. Um, and then um, I wanna finish with this, which is my newest kind of where I'm going now. And what I'm doing now is really trying to highlight this story of the bull kelp. Um, and it starts with the story on the North Coast that I've just told you, but in fact, it extends bull kelp. Um, there's interesting things happening in terms of kelp restoration in Oregon, on the Oregon coast. Um, Southeast Alaska has all sorts of kelp farming going on. British Columbia uh, and um, Vancouver has all sorts of interesting ecological stories to tell the, the First Nations uh, role in bull kelp recovery uh, in British Columbia is very, very interesting and, and going way back in time. So how to collect this, <laughs> all of this research is, is my, my great challenge right now, but this um, image has become kind of an iconic image for this, my, my chasing kelp um, endeavors. I had a great show at this wonderful gallery called uh, the Great Highway Gallery out in the Sunset District here in, in San Francisco. And I got out all of my kelp squiggle collection and made this installation. Um, it was still during COVID times, which we're still in. So this was uh, available to all of the neighborhood. And I have to say the kids of the neighborhood really loved looking at this craziness uh, combined with the cyanotype. Uh, prints. And then the very last thing I did want to show you is a cast uh, kelp. This is cast in bronze. It's something I've wanted to do for ages. And I took one of my specimens uh, to a foundry over in Berkeley and had it cast in bronze. Uh, it's very expensive, um, but it's something that means a lot to me. Um, it's about cherishing this organism that is at once so resilient in a way, and yet uh, is so vulnerable. Um, and so my whole role as an artist and an author is to really kind of bring us into this world uh, where these seaweeds and the kelps have come up with all these different solutions uh, for the extraordinary environment that they grow in. So this is where I'll end. We have lots of time for questions. Please, I have my email here, go to my website. Um, um, email me. I'm, I'm always open for um, connecting with you all. Um, these are my other books that are still, many of them are still in print. I know that Flashlight Books has not only The Curious World of Seaweed, but I think they've also ordered Beach Stones. Um, and please do support Flashlight Books. They're a wonderful small independent bookstore. And with that, um, we will go back to Robin. I think Robin is going to be um, uh, collecting questions and I'm absolutely delighted to um, answer some questions. Oh, we have a lot of great questions tonight, Josie. It's really, really nice. And some of them you answered as, as people were asking, as though you were reading uh, your listeners' minds, which is, is always a good thing. Uh, uh, Rachel Moskowitz asks you, what are your views on regenerative seaweed farming? And do you see your work as playing a role in the promotion of this industry? So seaweed farming is, um, oh, it's up and coming uh, 
really fast. So I actually have this dual life where I live here in San Francisco, but I also spend a lot of time on the coast of Maine. And I'm actually going to Maine for two months. And Maine, the Gulf of Maine is really the center of seaweed aquaculture. There are so many young um, fisher people uh, fishers there who are trying to come up with an alternate um, way of life that is a working waterfront. Uh, most of the lobstermen know or, that the lobsters are marching to the east. So what does fishing mean in the future? So seaweed farming has really become um, one of the go-to, especially in the wintertime, um, one of the go-to um, uh, strategies for being a being a, a fisher person. One of the beauties of seaweed farming is that it is regenerative. Uh, there's no fertilizer. Uh, you um, it's it's positive. It's net positive. Uh, but the Gulf of Maine is very different than the coast of California. And the coast of California is very rough. Uh, it does involve lines and buoys, um, and uh, you have to attend to your your lines, your, your seaweed lines. I know there's an experimental farm going on up right now up in Humboldt. It's, so it's a partnership between uh, UC, um, Cal State at Humboldt and Green Wave and I think California Fish and Wildlife or the Nature Conservancy are all partnering. Um, the the um, getting licenses in California for seaweed farming is uh, by all measures uh, very tricky. Uh, it's a long process. But it's everyone, there's so many experiments going on. And I've been looking at this story for, for quite a while now. And I think it's really interesting that everybody's suddenly realizing that all of this experimentation has to happen on all sorts of fronts to figure out how to not only restore um, the kelp forest, but also take pressures off of our big ag uh, and find alternative ways to uh, feed us. Um, I'm, I get a little frustrated because <laughs> we should have been thinking about this 20, 30 years ago, um, but um, because it's, it, it wasn't the forest, we haven't been able to see it. Uh, there's a lot of money, a lot of, the, um, uh, a lot of the sea grants are right now going to all sorts of um, experimentation, um, whether it's seed farms, um, genetic testing, um, aquaculture. It's rich right now, a lot is happening. A lot is happening. Marion asks, what do people need to know before harvesting or foraging for seaweed? So the number, so um, I'll, I'll kind of get back. So the number one thing you need to know is where you are. And really most of California is, um, is protected. So really, and this is true whenever you go to the beach is know what kind of a protected area you are in. If you are at the Duxbury Reef, say, that is a protected area where you cannot take anything. Um, and it's not very well posted. The last time I was there, there was a family with their bucket and all the little critters in the bucket. And um, it's just, you can't take seaweed from there. Um, um, I am not, I, I think that we have to be very, careful about foraging. Um, my views are that we have to really let these ecologies be. Now, there are people who are foragers and they are licensed and there's a whole program for harvesting um, seaweed that's regulated through fish and wildlife. Um, and and the, the historic foragers do it very carefully and they know where they where they are um, and, and for native communities that have foraged forever, they also know how to do it so that you're not harming the reproductive uh, parts. But I'm not one to encourage all of us to go out and forage for seaweed. Um, I collect from the rack. Um, I will only take a live seaweed if I'm with a scientist and we're doing research and we're in a place where it's allowed to happen. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, I say buy it, buy your seaweed from the store and cook with stuff that, you know, salt point seaweed is, is doing because they're the people who know how to do it well. And we don't need more foragers out there. Let's see, you talked a little bit about um, restoration of kelp, but um, another, Kenneth asks what efforts are going on to restore seaweed? 
So seaweed is kind of the smaller intertidal zones. And they really are doing, if the, I will be up on the North Coast shortly on the great spring um, low tide. So just all you tide poolers, they're coming. In two weeks, we have really good morning low tides and that's when to get out into the tide pools and see how the seaweed is doing. Typically, um, the seaweeds are, are not something we're worrying about. They will fluctuate from year to year. Um, so, I have a friend who is one of those harvesters, uh, Larry Knowles up on the North Coast. He's been harvesting for 30 years. He can put his foot in the water in springtime and know whether it's gonna be a good year or not. And that's directly um, tied to how cold the water is. Um, so there's restoration efforts. The, the big efforts right now are in the kelp forest and the eel grass um, forests of, of kind of shallower ecologies. Seaweed itself, um, we just kind of have to hope for um, nice cold ocean. <laughs> we just need to stop putting CO2 in the, in the air. Yes, indeed. E. Dalton, and this goes back to what we were just talking about, but I think it were, it's worthy of being addressed. How guilty should I feel about eating seaweed? Not, not guilty at all. I mean, eating seaweed is really, yeah. really healthy for us. Um, and so I think, um, that the the people who are supplying now the now the seaweed you get from from um, from Asia is you know seaweed is farmed as a billion dollar industry. I mean you can see the seaweed farms off the coast of China from the satellites. Um, the Koreans have been eating seaweed for you know millennia. Uh, when you give birth in Korea, you have andaria soup. That's you know, and you eat it on your birthday. So seaweed is eaten everywhere. We're kind of behind the times in terms of eating it. Uh, it's just I think we have to be careful. These nearshore ecologies are very fragile. And I think Duxbury Reef is a really good example of where um, it, there's so much effort to preserve that and yet it's, it's so popular. It gets trampled and you really have to be careful. And that can happen in other places, especially now that we're all outside and we're all exploring the coast. So um, I say, get your seaweed from trusted sources and eat away. James asks where you where you can buy edible seaweed. Oh, you can buy it at Rainbow Grocery, um, Salt Point Seaweed, um, Rising Tide Sea Veggies. Um, that we should look those up and put them in the chat. Um, Salt Point Seaweed is a group right up in Marin. Um, um, so I know Rainbow Grocery has a well when they had their bulk items. You can find seaweed in most of the but you know good grocery stores these days or good alternative grocery stores. So we have an anonymous attendee who would like to know what are some really good beaches to visit where you often encounter seaweed? Is there a good time of day, say, to see seaweed? So one of the things to do first, when you want to, I'm gonna reach over here, is either get an app on your phone, but I actually really like this tide log. And these are these wonderful tide logs. I get them every year. And they show, it's Escher, it's these beautiful visuals. And if you open it up, you will see when the low tides are. So I'm constantly referring to this in terms of my, making my plans to go to the beach or go tide pooling. So you wanna go at a low tide. Um, well, around here, Fitzgerald Marine Reserve down to the south in San Mateo is uh, a wonderful um, tide pooling spot. Duxbury Reef, as I said. Um, what I love about Duxbury Reef is there's the reef part, but if you go on Agate Beach to the, to the right on the beach part, there is a place where the detritus collects. And if you get into that, it's, it's guaranteed to be there. And that's where the red seaweeds collect and you hold them up to the sky and you can start to see all these shapes and forms that I've been talking about here. Um, there's a wonderful, beach up in Bodega Bay called Pinnacle Gulch, which is kind of a new find. Um, Salt Point State Park has some wonderful tide pooling up around Jenner. Really, um, just get out, just be careful. You know, really never turn your back on the ocean. Um, wear good rubber boots. Don't care if you get wet and just, and take care um, with the organisms that are there. You know, if you look under a stone, you turn it back again. Um, but those are my favorite, those are my favorite places. And this is a really good time 
um, in late April, May, around Memorial Day, I think there's some fabulous low tides. This is when all that new growth is coming. So you'll start to see the Halosaccion coming up. Um, the Postelsia is coming up, all the, all the seaweeds. It's a wonderland. So Joe Weibel wants to know if you have seen the multi-volume book set called The Nature Printed British Seaweeds, a history accompanied by figures and dissections of the algae of the British Isles 1859 to 1860. It's a long title. Ooh, no, but I, so, ooh, I'm, so I, I'm curious if it's related to William Henry Harvey, because William Henry Harvey, so I would love to get, I should um, it, just get- um, uh, I'll capture who, that for you. Yeah, put, um, I'm just opening my chat now. So um, who, who sent that question? Jill Weibel, and it's in Jill, the-, uh, in the Jill, email me, <laughs> because, <laughs> because Jill, we could have a Jill. great, I would love to see that book. And we could have a great conversation about, um, about Anna Atkins and her book in 1840 was she made that book because she was frustrated because the very first book describing British algae was by William Henry Harvey. And I write about him quite a lot in the book, but his first publication in 1840 did not have any illustrations. And she was very frustrated. She, so she said, well, I'm gonna use this new cyanotype technique that my neighbor is just working out. And, and make these cyanotypes. And then later around the time of this book um, um, that um, we're mentioning here is when William Henry Harvey came out with his illustrated version of the description of the, the British seaweeds. So I don't know whether this is related to that, but it's about that same, about the right time period. Oh, interesting. Well, Joe, I hope you will um, email Josie and yes, in touch. I love that. Ooh, yeah, <laughs> sure. Now, a lot of the the questions that are left are are some of them are comments. Uh, one person says she loves your prints, and have you ever considered making fabric? And I thought that is a great idea. Hmm. I don't know if you know about spoon flour, but that is a great source for making printed fabrics. Mm -hmm. um, but the rest are kind of about your scanner and your scanning techniques. And sure. we did go over some of it, but people are interested in the brand and the model. They wanna know how much um, your scanner cost. Um, some people wanna know if you have tips for photographing actual photography in the field. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are asking questions about how you protect your scanner from the wet when you use it. Sure. Anyway, I don't know if you just want to- sure, Let me just talk a little bit about my scanner. So my scanner here, I showed you a slide of it. It's an Epson, um, 10, Epson 10,000 XL. So I bought this scanner in 2009 and it has been my art, art making, book making tool for all of these years. And one of the things that's really interesting is that the scanner technology doesn't really change. Um, but the interface changes. So I, I actually use a very old, <laughs> um, we'll, we'll get into the weeds here, but I ha keep a very old version of Photoshop on my computer just for the scanner, the Epson scanner interface, which I really like way, way better than some of the third party scanner uh, utilities. Um, so the scanners that they, Epson makes the same scanner today. It has a different number, I think, I think um, I bought this scanner, I think for a couple thousand dollars in 2009, um, but um, it cer certainly has amortized over <laughs> the years. And I think now it costs maybe $3,000. So it's, it's a big, it's, it's, but it's my lifeblood. It's absolutely my lifeblood. Um, and what I love about it is that I can, I have this incredible range of um, resolution I can scan in 48-bit color. So I make these really rich, color deep, uh, rich, raw files. Um, and then I can work with them in Photoshop, in Lightroom, and not and still come out the other end with these big, really rich, um, very, very good files. So I can then print to all sorts of different applications, and I've got um, really good base material. So I can make my fine art prints uh, without um, kind of any, any degradation to the file. Um, 
what were some of the other questions in there? Let's see. Oh, oh, wet. Okay, so so yes, I oh, do yes. put wet specimens on my scanner. So the wonderful thing about a scanner is that it's glass, and the Epson makes a beautiful product. I mean, I've so so the glass is very well sealed around the edges. The beauty of glass is that glass is impervious to wet. So I put put um, specimens fresh from the beach. If you're collecting, here's a little collecting tip. If you're going to scan something or you want to um, work with your specimens, maybe you want to press them onto herbarium paper. Um, if you bring them back from, from wherever you're collecting them, you just need to put them in the refrigerator. You don't need to bring, they just need to stay cold. They don't need to necessarily stay wet. So I will put specimens that are somewhat wet. I will usually like blot out, you know, they're not dripping wet, um, but still somewhat wet onto my scanner. Uh, and then I can always clean the glass um, with, um, wind, you know, with glass cleaner. So I always have glass cleaner there um, and I just take care. I just put things on my scanner carefully and I've been using it all these years and I have very, very, very few scratches on my scanner. Fantastic. Um, I know we're running out of time, but Lauren wants to know if you have tips for algae pressing. So algae pressing is a whole other um, uh, world. Um, I have a press. Um, I would say the tip that I just gave about um, keeping them cold uh, in the refrigerator until you're really ready to work with them. And then you float them out in a, in a pot or in a tray of water and you can slip your herbarium paper under into the water and then the, the um, the specimen kind of lays out onto the wet paper and you use some tools like a, a butter knife or something to, to spread out your specimen. Um, so I, I hope that someday we'll open up and I'll start doing workshops again. Um, but you could probably find some good YouTube videos on seaweed pressings. I have a press, uh, it's back in my garage, back in my other workspace, but getting a good um, plant press uh, is good and you need blotter paper and cardboard. Fantastic. Well, let's make this the last question in there. I'm sorry, I couldn't answer everyone's question. We really had a lot of questions, Josie. Um, Sarah wants to know if you have any advice for combining natural science and visual art. She knows there's a long tradition of this and um, wants you to know she thinks that you have a wonderful, unique way of approaching it. And Oh, well, thank you. And I think this is a really, really interesting question that I think is very um, appropriate for right now in our world right now, because we have a lot of scientific information that we need to get out to a much broader audience. And so one of the things I would say, so there's the, the world of scientific illustration is one area where science and art meet, but that's not where I go, but that is definitely, there's um, a whole wonderful program down at um, Cal State Monterey Bay in, in um, scientific illustration. But for me, I'm really, um, I wanna encourage anyone who's really more on the art side to say, you can learn the science. Like I have no science training whatsoever. I was a sheer art major all the way through undergrad, through grad school, I lived in the dark room. But at one point, these algae said, you have to learn about us. And I know the science. And I think going that direction, you know, scientists need to reach out and experiment with art making. I think we need to bring designers into the science world. Um, I teach in the School of Design at San Francisco State, and these young designers are brilliant. And they have just such great training in taking complex information and uh, synthesizing it into a visual presentation. So I really want to encourage um, people to bring designers into storytelling. Um, and um, so <laughs> we have to just keep approaching the, the idea of bringing art and science together from all sorts of different directions. And to me, that's what design is all about. Well, Josie, I hate for tonight to end. I feel like we could just talk all night, or at least I would like to, but but time time has gone by. And I must thank you. I I hope everyone enjoyed your presentation as much as I did. I think that they did. And um, I thank everyone for joining us tonight. 
Um, as I said before, if you enjoyed tonight's program and you look forward to more, we invite you to make a contribution to the Walnut Creek Library Foundation. Click the donate button in the chat box or the donate button on our website at www.wclibrary.org. All contributions will be matched up to $500 by Gary and Jean Picorni. We hope you'll join us for next month's Live from the Library program, showing up boldly the political and organizing history of Black women, such a timely issue. And that's on May 12th. More information in the registration link can be found on our website. You can also sign up on our website to receive the monthly e-newsletter and keep up to date with all of our wonderful programs and activities available from the Walnut Creek Libraries. Thank you again for attending and good night.